The title of our sermon this morning is Living Faith in the Risen Lord. Living Faith in the Risen Lord. This is part two. In our text, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, as we're working verse by verse by verse through the gospel of John, and we've come now to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the evidence or the testimony of the empty tomb. Now in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, having anointed the body of the Lord Jesus Christ with a costly mixture of myrrhs and aloes, and having wrapped the body in linen cloths, as is the custom of the Jews to bury, Joseph and Nicodemus laid the Lord in a garden tomb next to the place of his execution, known as Golgotha. For fear that someone might steal the body, and at the insistence of the Jews, Pilate orders the tomb thoroughly secured. A large, heavy stone was rolled over the front of the opening. A Roman seal was placed over the stone, and a Roman guard was set, all to ensure, in his own words, that he would rise again on the third day, all to ensure that he would remain buried there. His word, his promise to rise, would remain buried with him. As the late afternoon sun began to set on that Friday afternoon, Mary Magdalene, the other women with her, go to buy and prepare spices and fragrant oils, as Luke says, when they would visit his tomb on the morning after the Sabbath to anoint his body. Early on the Lord's Day, while it was still dark, Mary, the other women with her, set out for the tomb to further tend to the body of Jesus Christ, carrying the spices, carrying the oils that they had prepared, They were going to anoint the dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ. They talk with one another as they go, as they make their way out of the city. What are we going to do about the stone that lies over the tomb? It's too large, too heavy for us to manage. They expect to find, when they arrive at the tomb, they expect to find the problem of the stone. They expect to find the dead body, the corpse of the Lord Jesus Christ. They never expect to find that stone rolled away and never expect to find the tomb empty. And John chapter 20, verse 1, John records that on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Immediately supposing that someone had stolen the body, her heart once again torn apart with grief, Mary immediately runs away to find Peter and John. And in verse 2, she ran And came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Having considered last week an introduction to this text in verses 1 through 2, we come again to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, and to John's account of the empty tomb. As we work through the text, John intends through the text by the Spirit of God, to cultivate a living faith in the risen Lord through the eyewitness testimony of the empty tomb. In other words, brother, sister, our faith is not in vain. Our joy is not baseless. Our future is not uncertain. This is not based in air. It's not a groundless claim. Our hope is not an empty dream. It's not a dead hope. It is a living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And we can say with the psalmist, we can praise the Lord with the psalmist, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave for he shall receive me. Or with Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And Paul exhorts them to comfort one another with these words. These words are words of comfort, amen? This truth, this theological reality, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a truth that comforts the saints. We're to be comforted with these words. But listen, if you're still dead in trespasses and sins, if you're still an enemy of God by your wicked works, then this text is for you too. John intends, 
He hopes by the Spirit of God to provoke in you also a living faith in the risen Lord through eyewitness testimony of the empty tomb. He lays out the evidence for you for faith. He writes that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed one. He writes that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, come to take away the sin of the world. He writes that believing you may have life in his name. John writes the text for you also. The king of terrors, as Job says, gives you this warning from his word. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, giving hope to his people, but Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, warning the unbeliever. There will be a resurrection, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting shame and contempt. Now this judgment, at the end, John writes in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, John says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books, you will be held to account for the way that you live your life, for those things that you've done. You will be held account to account for your sin. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, the Lord says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But listen, verse 8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you thirst for the water of life this morning? Do you thirst? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Aren't you sick and tired of sucking in the sewage of this world? The sewage of your own sinful life? Aren't the wicked things that you do wearing you down? Aren't those wicked thoughts in your mind, your wicked heart, isn't it weary to your soul? Don't you want the water of life? The Lord Jesus Christ cried out of the temple in John chapter 7, verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The spirit and the bride, Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. You may say to yourself this morning, listen, I'm here, but I don't thirst. I don't thirst. I don't hunger and thirst for righteousness the way the Bible describes. That's because you're spiritually dead on the inside. You are spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins. Plead with the Lord. Plead with the Lord to raise you to life everlasting. Plead with the Lord to give you a heart to seek him. If God can raise children of Abraham from the stones, then surely he can give life to your dead heart. In John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, John intends through the Spirit of God to cultivate within you, to provoke within you a living faith in the risen Lord through eyewitness testimony of the empty tomb. You can go there with Mary. Right? You can go to the empty tomb with Peter and John. You can stand there at the mouth of the tomb and gaze on the tomb empty. Christ is risen. Christ is raised from the dead. There will be a resurrection for you and I. There will be. Now he does this. He gives this evidence through several means that we see in the text. One, through historical eyewitness testimony. And that testimony through multiple credible witnesses. 
Two, through historical evidence. For example, the record of Pilate and the soldiers that was told even at the time that John was writing this gospel that the soldiers had fallen asleep at their post and while they were sleeping, someone came, someone came and stole the body away. But thirdly, this evidence, this eyewitness testimony given even through the weak and immature faith of his own disciples. It's very compelling, very compelling. Woven into the very fabric of the biblical narrative is a picture of faith informed by the resurrection and faith transformed by the resurrection. You remember with me, their faith was weak. This is a dejected, defeated, dispirited, disillusioned, doubting group. And their faith is informed, their faith is transformed through a powerful encounter with the evidence of the empty tomb and the resurrected Lord. The reality of the resurrection changed the way they thought. It changed the way they thought about Christ. It changed the way that they understood Christ and what he came to do. It changed their understanding of theology. In changing their understanding of Christ, their understanding of theology, the resurrection changed the way they lived. It changed the way they served. It changed the way that they worshiped. It changed the way that they preached. It changed the way that they died. It changed the way that they lived their life. So last week, as we considered our text together, we began unpacking pictures in the text, right? Characteristics in the text of their faith that we see there. And we began considering the impact of the resurrection on their faith, on those pictures of faith. We looked first last week at their tested faith. Their faith was a tested faith, tested by persecution, tested by the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ that they saw, primarily tested by his death on the cross. However, in light of the resurrection, they go from being despairing, dispirited, discouraged, disillusioned, to being bold, courageous, full of faith witnesses for the Lord, even unto their own deaths. Secondly, we unpack the devoted faith of Mary in verses 1 and 2. From the Lord saving her in Luke chapter 8, she faithfully and devotedly served the Lord, followed him everywhere he went. She was there with him at the cross. And now she's the first to witness the empty tomb. They're serving him there at the tomb, though he is dead and buried, mourning, weeping at the tomb, despairing, discouraged, doubting, disillusioned, but soon to be serving the risen Lord in joy, rejoicing in the power of his resurrection. Her faith informed, her faith transformed Devoted faith, but much more so in light of the resurrection. Now, on your notes, consider point three with me. Theirs was a responsive faith. Verses three through ten. Theirs was a responsive faith. Now remember, as we work through the text, Mary, Peter, and John are genuine believers at this point. They've been genuinely saved. They've turned from their sin. They're following Christ. Right? They're trusting Christ. By the grace of God, they believe what he teaches and they're following him. Remember that in Matthew chapter 16, right, verse uh, 13, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? They answered him, the disciples answered him. Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter steps up immediately and answers, you are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus answered Peter and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Theirs is a God-gifted, God-given faith. However, now often in the gospels, don't we? We see the weakness of their faith, the immaturity of their faith, often exposed. Just here in the gospel of John, you know, Peter makes that, Bold confession in Matthew chapter 16. But here in the Gospel of John, we often see the frailty of Peter's faith, don't we? We see the frailty of Peter's faith. The one who made that good confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the same one who denies him three times on the eve of his crucifixion. The one who said, I'm ready to die for you, is the same one 
who could only bring himself to follow at a distance when he was led away at his arrest. Peter and the other disciples responded to the revelation that they had been given, but often that response was weak. Often that response was vacillating. Sometimes that response was compromised. However, and what we'll see as we work through the text, in the revelation of the resurrection, that weak, vacillating faith on the part of Peter is fueled, fanned into a white, hot flame. And that flame burns hot until Peter's own death by crucifixion sometime later. And Peter said, wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord. So he requested that they crucify him upside down. Now consider with me the picture of their faith that John illustrates beginning in verse 3. Beginning in verse 3. John records in verse 3 that Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So upon hearing the testimony now of Mary from verse 2, right? They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Peter, verse 3, therefore went out, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. From verse 2, we know that this other disciple is also referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, from previous sermons, we know that this is a common way that John refers to himself. In humility and in amazement, John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So we can deduce from the text that John is the other disciple of verse 4. Now, Peter and John head toward the tomb. In fact... Verse 4 says, So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Now notice first the evidence of the empty tomb. Notice first the evidence of the empty tomb. Verse 5. And he, stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him. He went right into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, verse 7, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. First here, I want you to notice, you have two credible eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. Now, unlike the testimony of women at that time, the testimony of Peter and John would have been admissible in a Jewish court of law. Would have been admissible testimony. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. The law says that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Well, here you have two or th two credible witnesses. Today, people lie under oath all the time. Right? Today, people perjure themselves in court without thinking twice about it. No fear of God, no respect for the law, no, no respect for the truth. Then it was extremely evil, considered extremely evil to bear false witness. And you have two credible witnesses of the empty tomb. So you have this interlude here in verses 3 through 10, this interlude with the witness of Peter and John in a section of narrative that really emphasizes the experience of Mary. But remember, these two men led the early church. They did signs and wonders, it says, among the people. And they died preaching Christ. This was not dreamed up. This was not fabricated, right? We have two credible eyewitnesses here. Now, John, verse 5, stoops down to look into the tomb. In other words, this is not a grave. This is not a hole in the ground. This is a low tomb cut out of the face of the rock, 
And based on what he was able to see, it's likely that tomb, if you looked into the tomb, some of the tombs had a hole in the back and you would slide the body into the hole. Other tombs were built with a ledge around the outside, the perimeter of the tomb, and a ledge in the back under a recessed arch, they would lay the body. This is the kind of tomb that we're talking about here based on what we see in the text. Verse 5 says that John didn't go in. John stoops down to look into the tomb. And when he looks into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Now, in a way that is totally consistent with what we know of Peter's nature, Peter, a little slower, rushes right by John and straight into the tomb. Verse 6, he goes straight into the tomb, and in verse 6, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Verse 7, he saw the handkerchief that had been around the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, It was not lying with the other linen cloths. It was folded together in a place by itself. Now John, in recording the account, considers all these details to be very important. He considers all these details to be very important. One reason, I think, for that is to establish a very important and a very obvious contrast with the raising of Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. Turn back a few pages to John chapter 11 with me. And let's look at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 11, and drop down to verse 38. John chapter 11, verse 38. And we know the story. The Lazarus has died. The Lord Jesus Christ delayed his coming back. Lazarus has now died. He's been buried in the tomb, and he's been in the tomb four days. Verse 38. There's been this scene of weeping and mourning. Again, mourning is those who have no hope, it would appear. So Jesus, verse 38, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. They had to roll roll away the stone themselves, right? The stone wasn't rolled away for Lazarus. They had to roll the stone away. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord... By this time, there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Decay had set in with Lazarus, Lazarus, and he stinketh, according to Martha, okay? Psalm 16, a messianic psalm. Psalm 16 says that God the Father would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. It's again a contrast between the raising of Lazarus and the raising of the Lord Jesus Christ. The raising of Lazarus to his pre-resurrection body, to his former body, and the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead to his resurrected body. Verse 40, Jesus then said to her, did I not say to you, Martha, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, hobbled out like a penguin, wrapped up in linen. His face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him, let him go. Now the contrast is clear, isn't it? When we consider the evidence of the empty tomb, the contrast with the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11 is clear. What Peter and John saw, the details recorded by John in the account of the empty tomb are dramatically different. Why? Why? Lazarus came out of the tomb, still wrapped, bundled up in his grave clothes. The handkerchief still wrapped around Lazarus's head. And they had to set him loose as he hobbled out of the tomb. The Lord's resurrection body, the Lord's resurrection, the resurrection, the first fruits of all of those who would be raised in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord's resurrection body passed right through those grave clothes. In John chapter 20, the Lord's body passed right through the grave clothes in the same way that his resurrected body simply appeared in a closed room later that same day. Look at John chapter 20, 
John chapter 20, and look at verse 19. Verse 19. John records then, verse 19, the same day at evening, the same day of the empty tomb, the same day of his resurrection, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were, where they were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. It's interesting to me, right? It's interesting to me. They were huddled together in a room for fear of the Jews. The men are hiding in a room. The women, the first witnesses of the empty tomb and the resurrected Lord, but they're huddled together in a room for fear of the Jews. And the Lord Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, appears in the room with them. We'll look at the implications of that in a minute. Verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands, his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. He just appears in a room. The explanation for this is given in 1 Corinthians 15. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 with me. The explanation of this. Lord's resurrection body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And drop down to verse 42. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42. This is all different from Lazarus, right? Lazarus, at this point, having been raised from the dead, still waiting on his resurrection body. Lazarus will die again. Lazarus will die again, and at the end of the age will be raised with all those who sleep in Christ and will be given a resurrection body. Here, this is different, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a contrast between John chapter 20 and John chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, drop down to verse 42, where Paul explains in verse 42 that so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. There's a difference. Paul's setting up the contrast, right? Sown in dishonor, raised in honor. There's a spiritual body. There's a natural body. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, verse 46, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. What we see in the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead in John chapter 20 is his spiritual body. It's his resurrection body. Verse 47, the first man, Adam, was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. You and I were born of dust like Adam. We have a body like Adam's, right? And here's the promise and the hope and the joy, the resurrection. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have, been, as we have born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now remember, that's a promise to believers, that's a promise to believers. You will, brother, sister, you will be raised in the image of the heavenly man. When we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, right? John writes, you'll be raised in a resurrection body. What a, a joy. We're not going to be without our tent, so to speak. We're not going to be unclothed, so to speak. It's the way that Paul talks about that. We'll be given a resurrection body. That body given for the perfect and eternal enjoyment of the delights of heaven. A glorious promise. But listen, the opposite is also true. If you're not in Christ, you will be raised. You'll be given a resurrection body. That body perfectly suited to endure the torments of hell for all eternity. We will be raised natural to the spiritual. This is the evidence of the empty tomb. This is the evidence of the empty tomb. 
It's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Paul exhorts them from this truth. If you look at verse 50, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then how does Paul then exhort in the light of that truth, right? What's our response to these things? How are we to respond to this truth? Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The cause of Christ is victorious, And that cause, that victorious cause, that triumph is seen most clearly in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. He is raised to glory and all those in him will also be raised to glory. It's the resurrection. So listen, when you get weary, when you get When you feel weighed down, you feel the temptation of discouragement creeping into your heart, creeping into your mind. When you feel disillusioned, dejected, defeated, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul, hope in Christ, hope in God. There will be a resurrection. The victory has been won. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and so will you. And you'll be raised in triumph to everlasting glory with him. There's no sense in wallowing in self-pity. There's no sense in sitting back, laying back from the work. It doesn't matter how hard it is. Trust in Christ. Serve Christ. He encourages them. He exhorts them from this truth. Now, you might say, we consider the evidence of the empty tomb. You might say to yourself, as many have, well, listen, this is all made up. This is all just made up. These are the words of men I know over the centuries, uh, it's a telephone game, right? This changes and that changes and the other thing changes. By the time it works itself down to us, all this is, this is just a made up, this is a fabricated story. Really? <laughs> John is just making this up. The disciples sit down in a room together and they plot together their new religion. One of them speaks up. Let's start with the shameful beating and scourging and crucifixion of our leader. (laughs) And we're going to worship him in that and rejoice in that. Peter says, listen, I'll deny him when a little servant girl asks me a bunch of questions. I'll deny him. Really? Is that the way you're going to start your new religion? The rest of them jump in. In fact, we'll all forsake him. When he's arrested, we're all going to run. One of us is going to run away naked. Listen, we're all going to be weak and scared. When he's raised from the dead, we're going to be found huddled in a room for fear of the Jews. Let's have multiple people involved who everybody knows. Anyone can go to them and ask questions. Joseph, Nicodemus, two notable Pharisees. Let's get them involved. Let's have a tomb that everyone can find. Everybody knows where it is. It's the garden tomb just there off of the place of execution, Golgotha. We know where it is. We wanted to find a body, we could find a body. Listen, if they found a body, the resurrection, the whole story would be over before the end of the day. They didn't find a body. Let's have a plan that none of us really can understand. We don't get it until much later. Is this the way that you start a new religion, right? Is this the way these prideful, often prideful, sometimes weak men conduct themselves, right? While we continue to hide, why don't we send the women? We're gonna create a religion. Let's send the women 
back in that day where their testimony is not even admissible in court and people really don't respect their testimony anyway. Let's send women to be the first witnesses of the empty tomb. Let's make Mary the first witness of his resurrection. And after we've made all this up, after we've fabricated this whole story, let's all get together, link arms, go back into Jerusalem and preach the gospel until they kill us for it. <laughs> right? It's more a leap of faith to believe that this was all made up than it is an exercise of faith to believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. The reason that people do not believe is that people will not believe. And we've considered the evidence of the empty tomb provided by John. Consider with me now the response of Peter and John to that evidence, the response of Peter and John. I want you to see their response now to all this through John's use of three different Greek words for seeing, beginning in verse 5. It's interesting here, the three different uses of this, these words, these three different words for seeing, beginning in verse 5. Look at verse 5. And he, speaking about John here now, stooping down, looking in, John saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. That Greek word is blepo. It simply means sight. It just means sight, all right? It's just what John saw with his eyes, right? He saw the linen cloths lying there, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came, following him. Simon Peter went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. That word for saw, referring to Peter in verse 6, is theoreo which is to see with intention. It's to see with attention. It's intent observation. It's to intently observe what you see. Peter saw the cloths lying there and he considered what they meant. He thought that through, right? He intently observed what he saw in the empty tomb. Now, considering that then, he observed, he considered he saw with attention, theoreo, how did Peter respond after seeing the linen burial cloths lying there? How did Peter respond? He saw, he observed, how did he respond? The body of Jesus apparently missing from the scene, nowhere to be found. What he did not see was the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter responded much like the other disciples responded. Initially, he responded with unbelief. Look back at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. He responded like the other disciples responded. He responded with unbelief. Unbelief. Mark chapter 16, look at verse 9. Verse 9. Mark records that now when he, the Lord Jesus Christ, rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Verse 10, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. <laughs> right after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, verse 14, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he, the Lord Jesus Christ, rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Luke adds that Peter marveled to himself at what had happened. Nowhere does it say that Peter at this point believed. In fact, he's among those disciples who did not believe and was rebuked by the Lord that evening. Thomas finally believed. He repented, so to speak, of his hard heart when the Lord Jesus Christ physically appeared to him and he could touch him and handle him. John believes at the absence of a body, seeing the empty tomb, seeing the linen cloths lying there in the empty tomb. We are to believe 
We are to believe the witness, the testimony of eyewitnesses to the empty tomb. We are to believe the words of Peter. We are to believe the words of Paul. We are to believe the words of John. These words are God's words. These words are scripture. You are to believe what John is writing here. John writes that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You're not to be hard-hearted. You're not to be self-willed. You're to consider the evidence, the weight of the evidence. It is overwhelming evidence that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. You are to believe. You are to turn from your sin, and you're to put your faith and trust in him. You're to obey, right, as Paul says, obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is John's response? We see Peter's response John saw, just sight with the eyes. Peter saw, intently observing. Look at John's response in verse 8. John's response in verse 8. Then the other disciple, the disciple who came to the tomb first. That's the the second time that John wants to make sure you understand he's faster than Peter. Right? He comes to the tomb. He comes to the tomb first. John went in also. And John saw... And believe. Verse 8, the word there for saw is adon. Adon means to perceive through sight. Not simply to intently observe. Not simply to see with the eyes. Not simply to intently observe through sight. But to perceive and to understand through what he sees. Greek language is really helpful here. He perceives through sight. Both he sees and understands. And verse 8 says... He believes. John saw the linen cloths lying there in the empty tomb. He considered what that meant. Not only that the the tomb was empty, but that the grave clothes were still there. And he believed that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He believed upon seeing. Verse 8, this is the response of faith embracing the truth of the resurrection. Now, John John didn't understand all the theological implications of that at this point. He didn't understand that Jesus Christ must rise from the dead. That's going to be unpacked by the early church after this point. He didn't understand all the theological implications of it, but John believed that Jesus Christ had been risen from the dead. All that's cleared up in verse 9, where John records, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't understand how all this fit into the redemptive plans and purposes of God. They soon would. By the time that John wrote this gospel, the theological details are all worked out. Right now, John's faith, John's faith is based upon what he sees, specifically on who he doesn't see in the empty tomb. This is explained more fully in John chapter 2. Look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And drop down to verse 18. The Lord Jesus Christ clears the temple, clears the temple with authority, in power. And so in verse 18, John chapter 2, verse 18, the Jews answered, said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And we considered that last week. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying, I'm going to rise again from the dead. I'm I'm going to rise from the dead. The Jews then said in verse 20, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Verse 22, here's the explanation. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. They saw, they perceived, they intently observed. But at the end, when it was all said and done, what did they believe? They believed the word that Jesus Christ preached to them. The word that Jesus Christ said to them. This section in John chapter 20, verses 3 through 10, then concludes simply with this in verse 10. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. We can imagine, can't we, John having believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, John rushing home to tell Mary. Awesome to have been there to hear that, wouldn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ will appear to Peter 
And we'll see that text as we work through the gospel of John. Peter will believe. Peter will believe. He appears to the other disciples, the remaining of the 11, and they believe. Paul says that after that, the Lord appeared to over 500 brethren at once, and they believe. And Paul makes the point that of many of those, at the time of Paul's writing, many of those were still alive at that point in time. You could have gone up to any one of those 500 and asked them, what did you see? This was widely known, widely displayed, widely seen. Over 500 brethren at once, and they believe. Last of all, Paul says he was seen by him as one born out of due time on the road to Damascus, and Paul believed. From that point forward in human history, the Lord doesn't physically appear to anyone in the presence of anyone, in the presence of believers to convince them. A contra what a charismatic might say, and some of this crazy theology that we hear today, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't physically appear to anyone to convince them that he has risen from the dead, to convince them of the truths and facts of the gospel. What does the Lord Jesus Christ do? The Lord Jesus Christ uses the preaching of his word as the means through which people come to believe the gospel, through which people come to believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. He makes himself known on the pages of scripture. He makes himself known in the preaching of his word. Eyewitness testimony, historical accounts, irrefutable evidence, powerful life transformations, right? Supernaturally changed hearts, miraculous conversions. I was once a lying, cheating, adulterous sluggard, and I've been transformed by the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been separated from that sin. I've been cleansed. I've been washed. I've been sanctified. My life changed. I'm not the same filthy man I once were, was by the grace of God. God changes the heart. God changes the mind. God changes the desires. We see miraculous conversions. We see sinners raised to walk in newness of life. It is evidence of the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead. It is evidence of the truth of the gospel. Peter's response to this evidence was initially weak, and he was rebuked for it. Draws a rebuke from the Lord as Peter being hard-hearted and unbelieving. However, when Peter sees the risen Lord, when Peter believes the word that the Lord had spoken to him, when Peter is gripped with the reality and with the theology of the resurrection, Peter's response by the grace of God is worthy of note. Look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. How does Peter then respond in the truth of, the reality of the resurrection? Acts chapter 10. Look down at verse 34. Peter is off to preach the gospel to Cornelius, the household of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. Took three visions of a sheet coming down with all kinds of inedible creeping things in it for Peter to come to understand that nothing the Lord has made is unclean and that it's okay for Peter to go into the house of the Gentile, preach the gospel to that Gentile and expect that the Lord would save that Gentile through the preaching of the gospel. So Peter goes to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. As he arrives in verse 34, Luke here records in Acts chapter 10 verse 34 that Peter then opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth which the Holy, with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 39. And we 
are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. This is the preaching of the apostle Peter. And what does he point to? Verse 40, him, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, Peter says, who ate with him, drank with him after he rose from the dead. We handled him. We embraced him. We touched him. We ate with him. We drank with him. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify. Why, Peter? To what end? To what end? Did he command you to preach to the people? Remember, point one, he is an eyewitness to the life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 39, we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Two, he is our particular witness. One of few, it's another evidence here, there are no modern day apostles These men who wrote scripture are eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ at his resurrection. That's Acts chapter 1. There are no modern day apostles. These men are the the ones who were specifically chosen by God to witness this. He is a particular witness. One of a few specifically chosen by God of the resurrection. Verse 41. He didn't show himself openly to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Three... This was for the purpose, verse 42, that he would preach to the people what exactly? What exactly? That it is he, verse 42, who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Notice the connection of God's judgment, the certainty of God's judgment to the resurrection. Verse 43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And he ties forgiveness of sins to the preaching of the resurrection. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising that man whom he's appointed, raising him from the dead. God will judge. He is ordained, the Lord Jesus Christ, ordained to be the judge of the living and the dead. But listen, there's hope. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. If you'll believe in him. You know, in what way did Peter's preaching reflect? You think about his preaching in Acts chapter 10. In what way did Peter's preaching here reflect his more mature or more informed understanding of the resurrection. First, you can see woven into the text, he has faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. A person, the perfect, spotless, sinless son of God. We lived among him. We ministered with him. We saw his perfect life and we saw him crucified. Peter also has faith in the victorious work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was him whom God raised up, showing openly that he was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. It was faith. What informed, what fueled his preaching? It was faith in the Lord's application of that work and the promises of God to him personally. In light of the resurrection, Peter sees the application of that work of Jesus Christ. He understands what Christ came to do. He understands that those promises, that work applies to him personally. If Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, then I, through faith, will be raised with him. And Peter believes that. It's faith, informed faith in that understanding. Lastly, it's faith in the promises of God to raise and judge the living living and the dead at his appearing. It's faith that God will be faithful to his promise. Both to raise those who have put their faith in Christ to everlasting life and also his promise to raise those who reject Christ to everlasting shame and contempt. All this resulted, 
in zeal, in fervency, in faithfulness in Peter's preaching. We're to run to the empty tomb with Peter and John. You know where you do that? You know, they're, they're, they don't know exactly where that tomb is today. And as often happens in Catholicism, you have four or five locations pop up where people can, you know, make a little profit on tourism. They don't know exactly where that garden tomb is today. You know where we find it. <laughs> right here. These words written for us, these accounts written for us, this record written for us to edify, to encourage, to spur you on, brother, to spur you on, sister, to count this life as rubbish that you might know him and the power of his resurrection. What are you doing spinning your wheels in this world? Get out of that sewage and serve the living Christ. It's also for you who have not believed. You stand before the empty tomb in his word, there with Peter, there with John, there with Mary, as they recount to you from the pages of scripture their experience with the risen Lord. You are to believe. John G. Patton a missionary, writes about the opposition that he faced when he volunteered to be a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands, islands that were inhabited by cannibals. And John Patton writes that his professors, his friends, his colleagues, all urging him to stay at home. Wanted to serve the Lord, right? Wanted to serve the Lord. Everybody urging him to stay home. Patton writes, Amongst many who sought to deter me was one dear old Christian gentleman whose crowning argument always was, the cannibals, you will be eaten by cannibals. I want you to think about Patton's response. At last I replied, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. That's a healthy, faith-filled, biblically informed understanding of the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. All praise, honor, and worship and glory be to the one who is the resurrection and the life. Amen.